that awkward moment when the Da Vinci Code was actually right. I'm Tempest, and welcome to Time with Tempest, where today we're going to be talking about the Gospel of Mary and why you've only ever heard about it in the Da Vinci Code. And if you like this video, please subscribe to my channel to see what hidden history I uncover next. Now, let's begin our story. The first fragment of the Gospel of Mary was discovered in 1896 by two Englishmen, Bernard Pine Grenfell, an Egyptologist, and his friend Arthur Surridge Hunt, who specialized in papyrus. They were part of an archaeological dig in a city in Middle Egypt that has been excavated continuously since the 19th century. Preserved by the sands, papyrus, vellum, and even paper have been found and continue to change our perception of the past. The first fragment was found in a codex with three other literary works. It had been found in an alcove in the wall at a Christian burial site wrapped in feathers to preserve it. It was written in the 4th to 5th century, but was most likely written during the time of Jesus Christ. Written in the Coptic language, which was spoken in Egypt from the 2nd century BCE to the 17th century CE, it was translated from an earlier Greek language original. The original had 19 pages, although pages 1 through 6 and 11 through 14 are missing. In 1955, the translation was published, though it wasn't until the 1970s that people began to take notice. Two other fragments were also found by Grenfell and Hunt, both written in the Greek language. Their translations were published in 1938 and 1983. Since its translations, the Gospel has been a source of incredible controversy, mainly from the Christian Orthodoxy, who do not accept it as canon even though historians accept it as being a real part of early Christian mythology. And Dr. Karen King, the Hollis Professor of Divinity at Harvard University, has maintained that it was written during the time of Jesus Christ. The Gospel of Mary is about Mary Magdalene, and she's portrayed as the only apostle who truly understands Jesus' message and is favored above all other apostles. The Gospel recounts what happened after Jesus Christ's death and although the pages are missing in the beginning, we get the idea of what's going on. Mary tries to comfort his followers and is asked by Peter to recall teachings she had received personally from Jesus. She begins by telling him she received visions of Jesus, who tells her she is blessed. There is a break in the page, and when the Gospel resumes, Mary is now retelling a revelation given to her in a vision. She speaks of the ascent of the soul to heaven. But the followers deny that she would ever receive such knowledge. And Peter says, Did he really speak with a woman, without our knowledge, and not openly? Are we to turn about and all listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? To which Levi replies, Peter, you have always been hot-tempered. Now I see you contending against the woman, like the adversaries. But if the Savior made her worthy, who are you indeed to reject her? Surely the Savior knows her very well. That is why he loved her more than us. With the matter settled, the Gospel states they go forth and preach. This Gospel is almost completely at odds with the modern Christian Orthodoxy today, where the roles of women are diminished and the men wield all the power. However, unlike today, women held an equal, if not more important role, in the early formation of Christianity. They outnumbered men in the beginning of their religion, and because it was so new, there was no formal organization as to who could have what roles. Thus, women found themselves in positions of equal power in the church. There are even named women, like Saint Priscilla, who traveled and worked side by side with men to form Christian communities. But as Christianity began to grow and become more organized, that was flipped to reflect the gender roles of the time. A woman being the apostle who understands Jesus' message the most, and a woman who is trusted above all others, including men, 
undermines the very ideals of what we now know as the modern Christian orthodoxy. And that's because in 591 CE, Pope Gregory I erroneously decided that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute, despite the Gospels indicating otherwise. And throughout the centuries, this myth was perpetuated by artwork, sometimes directly commissioned by churches or high-ranking members of the clergy. Mary Magdalene is often dressed in red robes with loose flowing reddish hair, as opposed to the other women in the painting who are covered up. Judas is also sometimes depicted with the same hair color, indicating their status as sinners. Additionally, in the Middle Ages, a legend arose that Mary retreated to a cave to repent for her sins after Jesus' death, and caring not for material possessions, her clothes became tattered and fell off. Thus, she is sometimes depicted nude, with only her hair to cover her nakedness, and therefore sin. Even today, this myth persists, which is why in the movie The Da Vinci Code, when Mary Magdalene's name is mentioned, Sophie says, the prostitute, and is quickly corrected. By labeling her as a sex worker, Mary is devalued in the eyes of believers, and therefore her gospel is sidelined. Even though in the Bible, she is the only apostle to stay at the crucifixion, and according to Christian mythology, is the first to see Jesus following the resurrection. But it appears that the gospel of Mary, especially the inclusion of Mary being loved above all others, was just a bit too much for Christian orthodoxy to handle. Eventually, in 1969, the Catholic Church quietly admitted that they were mistaken and recanted their view of Mary as a sex worker. But unfortunately, the damage was done, and the myth persists to this day. But in 2016, Pope Francis tried to rehabilitate her image and declared a feast day for her, something that puts her on par with fellow male apostles and emphasizes her importance to the Christian world. Even with these changes, the Gospel of Mary and the importance of women in early Christianity is still being suppressed. So the film The Da Vinci Code wasn't too far off base in this scene. The Gospel of Mary is mentioned, with lines read from it, and the overriding theme of the power of women being suppressed by the church is spot on. Then we get to the main plot of the movie. which is the Catholic Church attempting to destroy the Holy Grail because it's proof of Jesus Christ's humanity instead of divinity. While the truth is far less dramatic, it's still kind of in line with that message. The Gospel of Mary is considered a Gnostic Gospel, which is rarely included in the Bible. Gnostic Gospels have the overall theme that the self and the divine are one and the same. There's no sin or repentance, just simply Jesus teaching spiritual understanding which goes directly against the modern view that Jesus is divine. Except he wasn't always divine. As stated in the Da Vinci Code, the First Council of Nicaea, formed in 325 CE by Emperor Constantine I, decided that Jesus was divine and not human. This set a precedent for Christianity and is the reason the Gnostic Gospels are rejected. But while they're not officially part of the Bible, they're still studied by some Christians and historians alike. They give a fascinating insight into Christianity and the importance of Mary Magdalene and women in those early times. So if you want to learn more about the Gospel of Mary, check out the links down in the description below. Or you can actually go and see them. The Berlin Codex is in, well, Berlin. Another is housed in the John Rylands Library in Manchester, England. And the final fragment is housed in the Sackler Library in Oxford, England. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked what you saw, please remember to subscribe, distribute your delight, or leave your calling card in the comments below because the YouTube algorithm gods demand it. Until next time, stay curious, history heroes.